Welcome back. Those of you who weren't here this morning, I'm Philip Stoney. And I'm sharing this session, the title of which is Commonwealth Policing and Legacies. And for the purposes of this session, the Commonwealth is Australia and New Zealand. Um, on my right is not Richard Hall, which is a lot more attractive than Richard is. And, uh, and <laughs> um, I'm very sorry Richard's not here because he really wanted to be here, but you can blame some of my scientific people and the way he's not able to be here and he's only apologies. So um, Georgie is going to read his paper, which is kindly provided for us. Um, and she's going to read it in her best Maori accent. Um, and then on my left is Bernard Jackson from Melbourne, the Victoria Police, and he will go second. Is that anything about Bernard? I'll allow him to introduce himself. Okay, thank you very much. We've got an hour and a half, so I suggest 30 to 40. If you'd like to have questions. Okay, thank you uh, for that. And apologies to Richard in advance, because uh, some of the pronunciation is a little on the tricky side. So Richard's paper entitled The Occasional Use of the Iron Hand, Post-Colonial Policing in a Tranquil Society. On the morning of 15th of October 2007, New Zealanders were caught by surprise. There were radio news reports of armed police raids upon Maori communities in the Uruwera region. That evening brought TV news images of heavily armed and masked police officers dressed in black, stopping or passing cars at gunpoint at a roadblock near the entrance to the town of Uruatuki. They were engaged in forcing terrified men, women and children out onto the road and demanding personal details from them. Who they were, where were they going, etc. Other more targeted raids in the region and elsewhere led to arrests under new anti-terrorism legislation. The Maori community liaison officers, who had long and painstakingly been trying to build trust between the local Tuhei tribe and the police, had not been briefed. The roadblock had been placed precisely on the boundary of the land confiscated from them in the 19th century. This symbolism was not lost upon a historically conscious tribe, long vocal in its attempt to attain political cultural autonomy. Before long, all terrorism charges against those arrested were dropped, and some relatively low-level firearms charges were substitu substituted. These await resolution. The Uruwera terror raids seemed a far cry from normal everyday life in a generally peaceful country. But although certain aspects of the arrests and roadblocks were unprecedented, in some ways such actions fitted a very long history of police targeting of Maori. This dates back to colonial days, when various quasi and semi-military police formations played a key role in subjugating Maori, including the armed constabulary which comprised the bulk of state forces in the last of the major wars between the tribes and the crown. When the rebel tribes militarily defeated by 1869, the constabulary supposedly demilitarized itself. But even then, many of its duties remained geared to suppressing <coughs> recalcitrant Maori. In the words of the job description for the commissioner of the demilitarized constabulary, the force was quote, to be remodelled and formed as far as possible on a basis similar to the Irish constabulary, unquote. While it would be a civil force for maintaining law and order, unquote, especially among the white population, it would also be, quote, armed, drilled and disciplined in such a manner as to enable it to meet, when necessary, the enemy in the field, now, the potential enemies were most generally perceived to be Maori. 
are people who retain strong collective suspicions about the police to this very day. As a senior police senior sergeant put it, in the context of Maori reaction to the 2007 rebels, quote, a lot of Maori negativity towards police comes from the police having a colonial responsibility. Some of that hasn't sat well inside Maori, Tikanga and Kawa, translated as customs and worldview, unquote. While the terror raids were an extreme manifestation of police and political attitudes and actions towards Maori, the sergeant's comment is significant. It points to both the importance of indigenous historical memory and the longevity of state resistance to the Maori struggle for autonomy. Maori have disproportionately experienced the consequences of paramilitary organization and practices derived from colonial times. While state policing did move in a civil direction from the, from the time the country ceased to be a colony in 1907, planning for use of extreme coercion remained. And though it was only occasionally used, this was more often against Maori than Europeans. In the words of their most recent official historian, the New Zealand police might be viewed in one sense anyway as suspended awkwardly between past and present. By its very nature and function, it is unable fully to shake off that military model. This has brought with it a great deal of baggage, especially vis-a-vis -vis Maori. The resulting occasional belief belies the preferred police imagery of protecting the public in ways that show neither fear nor favor to any race, creed, or class. I, as in Richard, will now trace the history of tension between the civilizing momentum of the post-colonial New Zealand police and their training for and occasional practice of quasi-military suppressionary techniques. In 1886, the colony was deemed to have attained both peace and civilization, and the police split from the military. Their principal purpose was now to maintain the general state order imposed on white and brown inhabitants alike. But only five years before, 1,800 armed constabulary had invaded the passive resistance center of Parihaka, torn down the flourishing settlement and detained its leaders. The military continued to supply men to the police after 1886, and the police force remained drilled and disciplined as if it were a military body. It retained the key function of reimposition of social discipline upon any groups attempting to spoil the development of the colonial project, one which aimed at creating an improved version of Britain in the South Seas. When New Zealand ceased to be a colony, however, it was fast emerging as a remarkably tranquil society. Its police were, as a consequence, as close to the concept of the unarmed English bobby as those of anywhere in the world. They were both professionalizing and fast losing the last of their formal links with the military. In colonial times, their emphasis had been on suppressing troublesome collectivities, recalcitrant tribes, or disruptive European groups such as gangs and navvies. But now, with Maori long since either crushed or incorporated and pioneering turbulence quietened, an increasingly self-policing society had been established. In the words of the most influential colonial governor, George Grey, quote, it is not the sword that must tranquilize and govern New Zealand, but the rule of law, unquote. The emphasis could now be on disciplining individual or small group violators of the official pre uh, precepts of, in the premier words, God's own country. This enabled the presentation of a generally more benign and cheaper policing profile to the populace. The official historian of the policing of New Zealand during the quarter century after the First World War called his book A Policeman's Paradise, but he put a question mark after that title and answered his own question in the affirmative. The Dominion of New Zealand, which lasted until 1947, had one of the highest living standards in the world, a reflection of its function as London's great Ant Antipodean farm. Large sectors of the population believed they lived in the paradise that the Crown declared their country to be. 
Europeans encountered Fiumari, the tribes having retreated into rural isolation as they rebuilt their devastated numbers. In a land where life was generally placid and peaceful, post-colonial policing was a far cry from the difficult and often violent decades of the 19th century. But the state needed, of course, to retain a definitive capacity to crush any disturbance against the desired order. The police continued to train for the use of the iron fist against any sectors of the population reacting en masse to the gap between paradisal rhetoric and prosaic reality. Their planning incorporated coordination with coercive forces outside police ranks. As Edwin Chadwick noted in 1868, the existence of a large indefinite force behind the individual policeman, quote, operates both as a preventative and as a strike force when prevention fails, unquote. The first crack in the post-colonial paradise occurred within a year of the establishment of the Dominion. In the 1890s, the colony's white working class had been accommodated into what was at that time called state socialism. Initially, strikes disappeared from a society in which capital, labor, and state were supposedly in organic partnership. But they resumed from 1908, by when it was clear that labor suffered hugely more than capital under such corporate state arrangements. During rising class tension, the police continued developing a civil image. In 1912, for example, British police helmets and tunics replaced military-style shackles and patrol jackets. But that very year, with the labor movement sufficed with radical and revolutionary action and rhetoric, a new conservative government and the commissioner of police engineered a showdown with militant labor during a miners' strike at Waii? No, Waii. Waii. Thank you. Commissioner John Cullen, who had begun his career in the Royal Irish Constabulary, undertook to mediate with the striking miners. In the course of this, they agreed to leave their headquarters virtually unprotected. A police escorted column of strike breakers attacked the hall the next morning, ousting a handful of pickets. One died after a mauling by the scabs. But with the support of the notoriously biased coroner, the police claimed responsibility in order to deflect attention from the role of the strike breakers in the attack on the hall. I recently, I as Richard, recently had a communication from the coroner's grandson, who recalls his mother telling of coming across her father and a policeman painting a large Union Jack on a metal plate. Unquote. This was placed above the entrance to the Union Hall when it was seized after which the police allowed the scabs to ransack the hall and run the town, and run the leading strikers out of town. At the time, this was dubbed by the union movement to be a regime of lawless law. In the following year, the state moved to crush widespread syndicalist influence strike militancy in the four main cities. Fearing the dominion was being swept up into global revolutionism by the Federation of Labour, the Red Feds. To supplement the police, huge numbers of special constables were sworn in. The mounted contingents among these were nicknamed Massey's Cossacks after Prime Minister William Massey, an Osterman with whom the police commissioner worked closely. Mostly young men of small farming origin, motivated by ideological hatred of the organized urban working class, the mounted specials rode in formation into cities. Many a worker's head was cracked in the ensuing confrontations. The government denied Red Fed claims that many of Massey's Cossacks were actually part-time soldiers masquerading as specials. But archival evidence that was suppressed for many decades indicates that this was indeed the case. There was a degree of overt infantry and naval support for the police too, but this was minimized in order to avoid provoking an escalating level violence. In the event, before the strikers were forced back to work, several exchanges of gunfire occurred, including military use of a machine gun to protect the special police barracks. As a result of 1913's great strike, police were given even greater powers over such matters as picketing. 
Soon too, with the advent of the Great War, there was to be even greater tightening of controls over those class warriors perceived to be enemies of public order. But police and politicians tended to see Maori as a greater threat to the peace and dignity of the state and surveyed and coerced resistant tribes accordingly. When the Kingitanga movement in the Wa Wa excuse me, Wa Waikato, Waikato, thanks, refused, Waikato, refused to fight in Europe for a crown which had confiscated its lands, conscription was imposed upon them. The police had to spend a great deal of time hunting down the young tribesmen who resisted to a man. What a contemporary policeman called the Crown's mighty fist had already again been unleashed in 1916 in the Uruwera Mountains, later the site of the 2007 terror raids. Here the Prophet Ruiz autonomy movement held what was deemed to be a subversive attitude to the war effort. Columns of constables, looking all the world like English bobbies, marched for several days through thick native forest headed by Commissioner Cullen himself. At the rebels' headquarters, a battle ensued, the casualties including Ruiz Song. After this, the full might of the law descended upon the Maori leaders, even though the police had been in breach of the law. The purpose of the mission had been to arrest Ruiz, but the warrant had been invalid when presented. The judge, however, told Ruiz that, quote, the lesson that your people should learn from this trial was as follows. In every corner of the great empire to which we belong, the king's law can reach anyone who offends against him." Unquote. New Zealand returned to social tranquility after the war, beginning what is now generally seen as a golden socio-economic age lasting some four to five decades. But the repressive wartime legislation continued. Being more prone than European to question aspects of the much proclaimed paradise for all, Maori particularly continued to feel the brunt of state coercion. So too did some inhabitants of New Zealand's territories in the Pacific. In the late 1920s, for example, the Maori independence movement was increasing in strength in New Zealand-controlled Samoa. Many dozens of New Zealand-trained paramilitary and military police were recruited for service in this League of Late Nations mandate. While well, a gradual transition from military to civil policing was already in place in Samoa, the sub-inspector, supervising this process himself, acknowledged that a military police ethos prevailed. On 28th of January 1929, during a mild procession in Apia, a New Zealand police NCO attempted an arrest. Fighting broke out and a police sergeant opened fire with a machine gun. In the ensuing chaos, a constable died, along with ten Samoan demonstrators, including High Chief Tapua, I'm not going to pronounce it. The incident had soured New Zealand Samoan relations to this very day. In the aftermath, more New Zealand police were dispatched to the islands, and many arrests were made during raids under cover of darkness. In 1976, a new conservative government policy led to a series of police dawn raids in Auckland which targeted overstayers from Oceania. The similarities in politically directed use of the Iron Fist against Pacific Islanders in Auckland, albeit some 50 years apart, did not go unnoticed. Within interwar New Zealand from time to time, the fist hit white workers as hard as it did Maori and other Polynesians. In 1932, for example, there was widespread opposition to the government's depression policies. Police attempted to contain this by clamping down on militancy, led, which led to clashes in major cities. In melees outside Auckland's town hall and in its main thoroughfare, Queen Street, the police were backed by naval and fire brigade forces and hastily assembled non sworn volunteers. The day after the Queen Street riot, 1,000 new specials were enrolled, including incognito members of the military forces. The Prime Minister then announced that anything done outside the law to assist the authorities in the execution of their duty would be validated." Unquote. But as usual, and understandably, 
the state preferred its coercive agents to be seen to be acting lawfully, and so the Public Safety Conservation Act was passed. This allowed a state of emergency to be declared, to be declared if circumstances are likely to come into existence if public safety or public order is or likely to be imperiled." Unquote. This legislation, like so many developments in the history of coercion in New Zealand, was based on imperial precedent. It did not need to be used at that time, but police did intervene in partisan fashion in a number of incidents during the Depression. A future police commissioner publicly asserted that it had been the assistance of special constables which broke the back of the Christchurch tramway driver strike, a key symbol of worker resistance to the state's policies. Such openly partisan intervention was unusual, but the police continued to prepare for contingencies requiring main force, including use of military as well as police facilities. In 1945, wrote the official policing historian of post-war New Zealand, Quote, Though the country had been in a state of civil peace for more than 70 years, the police were still trapped in the organisational forms of the colonial frontier. Unquote. While the use of the word trapped is misleading, the depiction of the police as an essentially paramilitary organisation is correct. Its 24-7 coercive capacity was re-emphasized in a number of actions against perceived enemies of the state during the Cold War period. In the bitter 1951 waterfront lockout, the Prime Minister announced that the Crown was at war with the watersiders and their allies. Communists were seen to be behind all the unrest, and the emergency powers of the Public Safety Conservation Act were invoked. The police were tasked, among other things, with arresting anyone who provided food to the strikers or their families during the 151 days of the strike. A number of contingencies had, from time to time, reinforced the militaristic contours of the policing function. The police learnt new methods from men it took on, from the disbanded Royal Irish Constabulary. In 1922, for example, a retired police constable recalled how... Sorry, I misread that. I do apologise. The police learnt new methods from men it took on from the disbanded Royal Irish Constabulary in 1922. For example, a retired constable has recalled how, in pre-war times, quote, freedom did not exist in the police barracks. The recruits had virtually no time and were continually under surveillance, unquote. They were trained to operate in disciplined, soldier-like formations. Eruptions of civil disorder, though rare in New Zealand history, confirm that the long tradition of paramilitary police training should continue. This remained the case even in the later 1950s, at the height of the New Zealand policeman as Dixon of Doc Green syndrome. In 1956, police training was transferred to a barracks at a military camp, and the first commandant and his physical training officers, both military men, strengthened the paramilitary aspects of training. Although the New Zealand police lost the word force from their title in 1957, in an effort to emphasise service over coercion, little changed in fundamentals. Nor did it from the 1960s, when specialisation began inside what had traditionally been a generalist force. The activities of new units, such as armed defender squads, supplemented traditional military-style drill and discipline. As a New Zealand police publication in 1982 acknowledged, innovations flowing from such efforts as a 1955 report into training, quote, were largely based on traditional techniques and concepts. Because they drew on New Zealand's army system as a model, they were reflective of local and conservative military methods, unquote. In 1963, Commissioner Spencer had typically referred to the police as, quote, a fourth fighting service. With the post-war urbanisation of Māori and the growth of social rebellion in sectors of society from the 1960s onwards, aspects of the pre-existing paramilitary framework of control were in fact strengthened. The police often sought advice from overseas forces with tougher operating environments than those which generally predominated in New Zealand. 
After violent demonstrations against American Vice President Agnew in 1970, the London's Metropolitan Police were asked for information on how best to handle hostile crowds. Chief Superintendent Gideon Tate, whose motto, Never Back Down, became the title of his autobiography, epitomized a coercive extreme within the police, and in 1973 defended an American airbase in Christchurch against anti-war demonstrators with an aggressive combination of police and military action. In 1981, the right populist Muldoon government, that which had cracked down on Polynesian overstayers, decided to allow the national South African rugby team to tour New Zealand. The resulting Springbok tour led to massive confrontations between citizens and the state. Police riot squads were formed and the military provided backup. After demonstrators prevented a game from proceeding, the police got tough, battening a peaceful demonstration in Wellington. And on the final day of the final test in Auckland, with over a third of New Zealand's police present, many thousands of demonstrators attempted to stop the game. Police lines held, albeit amidst great damage to bodies, property and civil liberties. Maori were prominent amongst the demonstrators and reportedly less surprised than most Europeans at the state's use of its iron fist, given the long collective memories of tribal peoples. These included numerous retellings of 19th century events, such as the Constabulary's invasion and securing of their territories. There are more recent memories too of such matters, as, for example, a high-profile police military operation to eject Maori from ancestral land at Bastion Point in 1978, resulting in 222 arrests. Other 1970s developments such as a police task force which focused on disciplining Maori and Pacifica people in urban streets, targeting policing of Maori youth in the cities, leading to a widespread dislike of the police and even to indigenous gangs and other groupings, internalizing a status of lesser breeds outside the law. By the 1980s, the police were headed along the path of modern managerialism and making much out of concepts of community policing. But both their initial and ongoing training kept them in close contact with their paramilitary past. Methods of responding to community resistance remained high on the police training agenda. A number of police who went into the Uruwera in 2007 were well aware of the police expedition of 1916 into that same region, it having been long presented as a case study at police college. Such studies were designed to complement the drilling, discipline and obedience that formed one of the bedrocks of the task of constable. Despite high-profile incidents involving European-based crowds, like the events of 1951 and 1981, coercive control techniques continue to be turned rather more often against Maori, notwithstanding increasing numbers of Maori police officers. Nothing like the anti-terror raids had occurred in an essentially white community and Maori tended to see them as just more of a long series of aggressive police activity directed at people of their race. Like so many previous state interventions, the raids seemed posited upon police inability to understand the Maori press for autonomy and historical justice and the words and actions flowing from it. I want to finish by returning to the Pacific arena where New Zealand's policing influence has been prominent Quite apart from the coercive policing in Samoa, the country has sent constables to Fiji, supplied the Cook Islands and Nui with police chiefs, and advised and assisted Papua New Guinea's police. Much such training and advice has necessarily reached back to the paramilitary policing traditions rooted deeply in New Zealand's past. However, such circumstances are fraught with difficulties of balance and degree. I address the following matters not to claim cause and effect, but to raise some very real problems of policing in the contemporary Pacific Territory. In Vanuatu, where New Zealand has conducted some police training, the war on terror has been used as a rationale, just as in New Zealand and elsewhere, for militarized policing operations. In 2009, the members of the mobile force within the, within the Vanuatu police were tasked by their leaders with systematic beatings of categories of prisoners with the aim of immobilizing them. A New Zealand provided judge noted, quote, that the plan involved breaking both legs 
a kneecap, an arm, and a hand, but so as to leave one hand and arm, an arm unharmed, presumably for eating and toiletry purposes, unquote. The beating stick in the interrogation room needs two hands to pick up. Vanuatu's commissioner of police falsified records relating to the beating of, to death of a prisoner. His mobile force officers refused to give evidence, disrupted court proceedings, drove through the streets of the capital brandishing firearms during the inquest, and then surveyed the judge's home. After a high-ranking police officer threatened to kill him, he fled from the force's operation cleanup. A New Zealand professor of peace and conflict studies has lamented that the Vanuatu mobile force, quote, does very little policing, seeing itself as a loyalist militia for the government, unquote. While this criticism is well-intentioned, I think it really misses the point that the VMF does do policing. It just does a very different type of policing to that which New Zealanders are used to. Namely, it practices a type of policing which would not have been out of place in some locations at some time during the 19th century, not just in New Zealand. To conclude, since 1907, the New Zealand state has occasionally felt the need to use an iron fist reaching back to colonial methods as well as using state-of-the-art specialist knowledge and techniques. The overarching civil direction of police development since the country ceased to be a colony has generally ensured that such episodes are relatively contained and controlled. However, ongoing vigilance is necessary to ensure that the iron fist continues to be presented only occasionally and in a restrained manner. The raids on Rotoki less than two years ago indicate that New Zealand has not yet got the balance right. Thank you, George. Um, well, that was a very interesting follow-on from many of the issues we discussed this morning, wasn't it? In, uh, uh, in the New Zealand context. So now we're going to now we're going to move to what New Zealanders call the Western Isle. <laughs> um, and uh, Bernard is going to tell us about. The Regional Assistance Commission to the Southern Islands, which is a nicely flow on from the Vanuatu example there. Um, and, but perhaps before you do that, Bernard, you could just say a few words about yourself, because I don't think many people know much about you here. So. Okay. Anyway, nicely flow on. Exactly half an hour. Thanks very much. Yeah. Bernie Jackson, uh, as I indicated before, I'm a practitioner within the policing field. Um, being a operational police officer within uh, Melbourne, Victoria, Australia, which is Victoria Police. Um, my background is more on the crime side of things. I was a homicide squad, armed robbery squad, and um, organised crime squad detective for many years. Um, however, after going uh, after uh, basically I think it was about uh, 18 years of operational policing, uh, I decided I wanted to head to the management side of the house and uh, have been, um, and I was lucky enough uh, in that role to head over to the Southern Islands to, uh, uh, as a capacity builder is what we, uh, the AFP call it. Um, and since that time after returning, uh, I've uh, taken up another operational role as the manager of inner city Melbourne, basically, in And that, uh, it's just general duties policy which encompasses everything. So today it's going to uh, talk on yes my my life and times in the Solomon Islands. Um, that's obviously uh, trying to put into context of where the Solomon Islands are, right next to Australia and just underneath New Guinea and uh, Vanuatu. It's kind of stuck in between the two. Of them. You see all there pretty well. And do you mind if I stay here and sit down? Because um, I've got a technology of myself that really mixed too well, so I'm going to be close to this thing make sure it works. Um, I'm going to give you just a kind of a brief rundown um, of uh, how we came to, uh, to interview. Um, it basically, just a, it's a very short and sweet uh, summary, but uh, the British rule commenced in the Solomon Islands in 1893. Um, I went, I this, so I've got about 50 slides, so you can get my PowerPoint, so I'll go as quick as I can. Um, basically, uh, it kind of, 
there's obviously a lot of issues uh, over time, but World War II brought about a movement for, internally to uh, become independent. Um, World War II also was the commencement of uh, why we, uh, as an Australia and New Zealand and other nations, came uh, to be in the Solomon Islands. Because the Americans, uh, when they uh, defeated the Japanese in the Battle of Guadalcanal, they utilised uh, the Malaitan um, locals to do a lot of their work. The Malaitans, uh, compared to the Guadalcanal uh, locals, um, Malaitans were more industrious, they were, uh, didn't mind the hard work, where the Guadalcanal locals were a bit more laid back and uh, didn't really enjoy the hard work. So the Americans used the, Guad uh, the Malaitans over on Guadalcanal, and uh, as a result, there was quite a number of, uh, uh, of Malaitans who um, took up residence in, on Guadalcanal. And that obviously, as time goes on, I'll talk about it later, but uh, uh, that move in itself in World War II um, had a very large impact uh, in years to come. But at the time, it was uh, uh, seen as uh, necessary for the, for the war effort. Basically, to cut a long story short, that uh, 7th of July, 78, uh, they did get independence from, from the British. And uh, um, However, the police force at the time um, remained very much uh, under British uh, influence. Um, in fact, uh, most of the uh, commissioners from that time, until uh, Mr Morrell, when he left, uh, uh, was all, were all British commissioners. Very... Uh, the locals and, and the, talking to the local Solomon Islands, they were very proud of that British heritage and the British uh, discipline in the, uh, in the police force. Um, it was something that they, uh, it was instilled into them, um, obviously they were British rule since 1893, uh, that's all they knew. And they knew, the, uh, uh, they just really uh, felt pride in uh, describing uh, the British influence and how they uh, tried to emulate uh, British ways. Um, as it says there, look, uh, basically from 78 onwards, um, the, the poor country just uh, failed to, to build. It, um, when the British left in 1978, there were paved uh, roads, there were uh, um, you know, buildings were getting maintained, were still maintained. Um, but that just started, uh, it, it fell by the wayside as uh, different governments after governments uh, took uh, power in the, in the country. Um, and it really culminated in 1997 as uh, the election of uh, Bartholomew. Like you, I can't pronounce it. That will do. As Prime Minister, um, he uh, he wasn't a very good leader. The uh, corruption was uh, starting to really uh, infiltrate um, really all areas of government, and um, the country just uh, there was no resources, no uh, money uh, to. Uh, for the um, infrastructure of the, of the islands. This is where we go back to the ethnic tensions of the Malaitans and the Guadalcanalians. Um, they basically build up uh, um, little uh, militia groups, and the Malaitans call themselves the Malaitan Eagle Force, and the Guadalcanalians call themselves the Guadalcanal Revolutionary Army. Um, as I said, the reasons before, the, the Guadalcanal people um, really wanted their land back. That was the basis to, to it all. Um, there was uh, a government intervention uh, in relation to it. They tried to sort it out through legislation that uh, the Guadalcanal could have their land, but the Malayans could uh, stay on it. It was like a lease sort of a, uh, arrangement. Um, but it, it just never, uh, uh, the whole issue never went away. There was um, great tension, uh, and they, they themselves call it ethnic tensions. Um, it led to, uh, in June, uh, the Prime Minister had been kidnapped by uh, the militia, the members of the Malaitan Air Force, because they felt, uh, uh, interestingly, the Prime Minister was Malaitan, but uh, they thought he wasn't strong enough to um, uh, you know, stick by their cause. They wanted a stronger leader. Um, this led to the Prime Minister resigning, and uh, this nasty man here, Manasseh Sogavari, he was elected as uh, Prime Minister. He was the Prime Minister when I first went there, and uh, you'll hear more about him later. A very, very corrupt man. Unfortunately, the unrest uh, continued, um, and the allegations of corruption um, certainly were um, just becoming uh, everyday uh, life around there, as I said before, in all levels of government, and unfortunately in the uh, police force. Um, 
ultimately in 2003 it led to a, a request for assistance. The uh, government um, at the time uh, couldn't handle it, the, as all level of governments were, uh, were failing. The, uh, the budget was uh, virtually non-existent. Um, roads were in disarray, uh, buildings were falling apart, and um, worth things, there was a, the ethnic tensions were um, uh, just going into uh, such a state that there was uh, murders every day. Um, we'll go into that in, a minute. in order for uh, it to uh, for assistance to um, come in, the uh, government had to uh, enact the facilitation of the uh, International Assistance Act, and that was ascended on the 21st of July. Basically, that uh, allowed for foreign countries to come in and be immune from the local laws, basically, so they could operate uh, internally in the country. And in the three days later, um, what's known as the Townsville Agreement was signed. And basically, it was originally signed by uh, Australia, Fiji, New Zealand, uh, New Guinea, Samoa, and Tonga. They were the uh, signatories uh, uh, in the initial times. Um, and there's a little picture of Honiara go through there. Um, it really requested immediate assistance on all levels. Law and order, and I'll go through it in a minute as to uh, what it is. And it led to the mission, the regional assistant mission to the Solomon Islands, which basically was deployed straight away. The first uh, objective was to restore law and order and security. That was objection, objection number one. Assist governance and economic reform, assisting real build to rebuild the Solomon Islands institutions. There's four kind of unique features of the mission. Um, Normally with uh, police intervention, that usually comes under the UN banner and it's a, uh, a combination uh, more military-led than anything else. This is the first uh, police-led uh, mission in relation to law and order and security. It did feature uh, a military contingent, both from Australia and New Zealand and uh, occasionally New Guinea uh, military. But they were uh, very much in the minority and they were there, um, I suppose as we're talking about it for that little coercive in fact so they were there as a presence and uh, never used basically. They did a lot of patrols with the time. The other feature was they straight away uh, realised that uh, it would be a long term commitment. They committed themselves to five to ten years. Um, it's been over five years now. Um, and as you'll hear later it's a long way off. Um, ten years is not realistic. And the mission was at the request of of the country, of the Solomon Islands uh, government, and more importantly for the region, it was actually endorsed by the Pacific Islands Forum, which is a, uh, obviously a forum uh, in the Pacific that all nations got together at the, within that area and agreed that um, uh, this was obviously the right course of action. Um, I don't know, this is what, uh, it's kind of the uh, bit of organisation chart of how Ramsey fits into this kind of things, the Pacific Island Forum Kind of over, it sits over the top and kind of is a controlling body of the mission, so to speak. I won't bother going through each uh, uh, area, but um, obviously the green part is where we came into it. Um, in my uh, talk and my uh, observations obviously <coughs> come from that spudding police force um, box there. Um, but the mission was a whole of government mission. Every uh, government uh, <coughs> department from uh, the Prime Minister down, had uh, advisors from uh, Ramsey uh, who had been um, there as an uh, advisory capacity builder um, for the country. Right. Now, I'll have a go at this. I was, usually, I was very good at pigeon for a while. Ramsey come for help on you and me blow Solomons, which basically means Ramsey's coming to help uh, everyone with the Solomons. The first phase, and that was uh, the key, the, the big message to the locals was uh, was that uh, uh, pigeon phrase. They used uh, there was about two thousand all up initially, um, comprising comprising the police, military, and the uh, development advisors in the, in the uh, government areas. Um, Law and order certainly was the, the, the key thing, and what they had to do obviously was uh, take away uh, the weapons. Uh, 
they had two options, they could go in there with force and take them away, but they decided uh, it would be like an amnesty, that they went in there and asked for them to be returned, and it worked. Um, there was a massive surrender of weapons, um, and very large ceremonies at the time, uh, press and uh, government there. Uh, it was a lot very symbolic to uh, bring them in and get them cut up. Um, they had uh, uh, like bonfires with them as well, and the uh, community uh, really got involved, and um, it kind of it did a lot to put uh, the minds of the people at ease, as it, you know, the weapons were going away and get back to peace. With that, um, obviously with the issues that uh, were taking place over the years, uh, there needed to be some sort of um, uh, arrest to be made, and as you can see, there were 4,000 of them. It's uh, quite a number for a small country of 500,000 people. Um, but unfortunately, the arrests went down from government level right down through to the police, and obviously civilians and the, uh, the uh, militia organisations. One of the most important things was this phase was to try and get back to some sort of normality as soon as we could. And um, the schools reopened, uh, buildings were uh, um, starting to be re rebuilt. Uh, there was a lot of buildings destroyed, a lot of um, farms. In fact, uh, during the ten tensions, uh, they used to have dairy farms and had a few horses and a few other things. Uh, every one of the uh, cows, horses, anything that wasn't um, uh, uh, anything wasn't um, Indigenous to them, you know what I mean. Um, it wasn't a local animal, it was killed, and basically they killed uh, everything um, foreign there. This was unfortunately a bit what it was like in those uh, times when um, uh, those two those ethnic tension periods, where people would just go through and destroy everything and anything. This photo was actually in a, one of the riots um, in 2003. Once we uh, you know, went in there and it, it initially um, kind of took control of the of law and order, um, we had to reassemble the Solomonized Police Force. And um, in that we had to identify uh, the good police officers from, from the not so good. And 25% uh, of them uh, were removed. Um, and then there was 88 who were arrested for corruption, murder, and, uh, and numerous offences. And that's out of a Police force of about a thousand. So it's a fair percentage. You can see. Um, the paramilitary divisions over the uh, uh, militia groups, the Guadalcanal and the Light and Eagle Front, um, they were disbanded. Um, uh, a number of the police officers were associated with those gangs um, and obviously they were arrested as a result. We had to get the courts uh, back up, up and running, um, and the, the, it was a fairly important part of it with all the arrests that were made. Uh, and the community really wanted to see that justice was being done. And the courts ran in conjunction with local uh, traditional law. Um, they went hand in hand. The, uh, the courts had uh, advisors from both New Zealand and Australia. There was Australian and New Zealand judges and magistrates, plus prosecutors and lawyers. And at every hearing uh, under the British system, um, they would recognise any traditional punishment that had been handed out using their own laws. Uh, something similar, similar it's simple as um, if it was a theft case, uh, the victim and the offender's family would get together and have compensation. So it might be that uh, I'll give you a pig and um, we'll call it quits type thing and they'd say, yeah, no worries. They'd go to the, uh, our courts and that would be told and the magistrates would take notice of it. There still would be a punishment, but it would be a lesser punishment knowing that the compensation has been paid. It worked well uh, for most things, obviously for the more serious offences of uh, murder and rape, which there were many. Uh, they took account of it and there was still compensation paid, but um, the, the, the uh, a sentence of um, you know, life imprisonment, which normally would be given, might be reduced to like 15 years, something like that, for a murder. Um, so there was some movement in the court system to be recognised that like the laws. Um, Obviously, the, this is a very important part of the uh, phase two, was to um, really try and get a functioning government to, uh, to operate um, and get rid of the uh, corruption that was in there. And um, obviously, an ombudsman and order of general were, were appointed. Um, all I can say very quickly is it really hasn't worked, but it's, uh, it's getting there.
And obviously we, uh, we managed to uh, assist with the um, budgets being developed and slightly increasing over time. Obviously very topical this part, but, um, but this is called POM training, public order management training, and it was part of training that we had to do when we went there. Um, you saw that photo of the police vehicle there. Um, there were riots on occasions, and um, the local police force who uh, didn't have the equipment or the expertise to handle it, so international police uh, had this equipment if required. Wait and get to Ramsey Bay come street, which means wait for Ramsey to come and fix it, was a sentiment that the community kind of grew over a number of years that there was a dependence on Ramsey and they thought that Ramsey was just going to fix everything, which obviously had some uh, issues come, come out of that. So we had to make sure that that wasn't the case. We had to build sustainability and self-reliance into their systems uh, on all levels. Capacity building is the way to do that, and uh, which is uh, was the key uh, to my uh, time there. I arrived in 2006, and we started the capacity building probably three months after I got there. So initially, it was uh, participating police force doing the work, making the arrests, doing the paperwork, taking them to court, etc. Um, we had to go through the transition phase of getting the local solemnised police to do this and we sit back and be advisors, which is really the whole reason why we were there. But it took, took about three uh, years to get to that stage. And certainly bridges are coming on and it's still happening as we speak. I left in uh, August 08 and uh, some of my colleagues are over there now and I communicate with them and it's still, still taking place and it will continue for some time. The big uh, thing we had to do was uh, get it across to the community that we were going after the, what they call the big fish, which is uh, you know, the big men of their communities. Um, their culture was that if uh, uh, someone who had an important uh, job, they're called big men, and the government were, were always called just the big fish, and obviously the Prime Minister was the biggest fish of them all. Um, and that's, their culture really um, the, the respect that that, uh, um, that person had in the community was unbelievable. They, they are they're like the chiefs. Every tri they, they were a very tribal community, um, and every tribe had a chief. But if one of the members of the tribe like, joined the police force, uh, that was seen as a good job. So you were a big man in that tribe as well, and you'd work together with the, uh, with the chief of the tribe. But, and as a result of that, and having that res respect, they also had this power, and the community would just uh, think it was you know, paying lip service to them if we let um, the government ministers just do what they like in corruption reign. So it was a joint uh, SIPF and PPF uh, operation to target and try and uh, you know, get enough evidence to uh, arrest the big fish of the communities, which would send a message to the community that you know, things were going to change. It worked. We arrested uh, three serving Solomon Island ministers, um, one being the police minister. Uh, for corruption and uh, instigating riots in 2003. Harold Kepke uh, got uh, life uh, uh, for murdering a uh, serving uh, minister, um, and that too was seen as a win for Ramsey because it just showed the community that uh, results were happening. Then we get into the picture of the uh, you know, they start a bit of capacity building. It's a New Zealand uh, police officer um, introducing um, the bicycle patrols in the area. You can see the condition of the, uh, the buildings back. That's the police uh, sleeping quarters for um, unmarried men. And they're supposed to have one, in, one per room, but there were about 20 in each one of those little rooms you can see there. And that's and just kind of it demonstrates the the uh, military and the police going into the community to um, spread the word of Ramsey and what they're about. It's a New Guinea uh, officer working with the military in one of the local schools. Um, as we went on, um, you know, it wasn't all a bit of roses. We weren't winning every, uh, at every occasion. Unfortunately, um, an Australian Protective Service officer was over there. He got murdered um, from a sniper who was in the, in the jungle. 
um, we had some sections of uh, the community, uh, probably very similar to what we were just talking about before, is that they, uh, Ramsey, were intimidating uh, the locals. And it was, their intimidation was just because we had uniforms, we carried firearms, that was intimidation in itself. So there was that feeling in, by the locals, by a, a small section. Um, as we, we certainly experienced a honeymoon period for a while. We restored law and order, things were starting to get back. There was this reliance on us. Then the questions started to come, and these were some of the questions of um, this intimidation that's against their culture, just, um, walking around and military being around. The biggest problem we had was uh, support within the government. Uh, because there were many under investigation, there were many of them who didn't want Ramsey to be there. Uh, and that led to the propaganda starting against uh, Ramsey. Uh, they wanted us out. Um, they wanted to, uh, and the big catch cry from Manasseh Sotovari, who was the uh, Prime Minister again at this time, was that they're a sovereign nation and respect our sovereignty, you should be out of here. And of course, because we're at the, uh, at the request of the, of the government, we could, they could withdraw that request at any time. So it was a, uh, an issue for us. But the uh, majority of the community supporters and the majority of the government minister supporters. However, uh, Solovari, uh, virtually every day in the media, we put propaganda out there against uh, Ramsey uh, to try and get support to uh, remove us from the island. As I said, the uh, community support was uh, up there, and that's, that's the main reason we've, uh, we've stayed. <coughs> Quick picture of that's the police station uh, in the central IR, just for the information. Just, I'll just go quickly through this. These are the uh, boats that we uh, we have supplied to uh, the government. Um, as you can imagine, there's a thousand islands there. The main ground to get a remote, to get around is either boats or uh, helicopter. So we've supplied all that. What we're doing. Uh, I'm going to keep going very quickly. Prison was uh, very topical because we had to put most of the uh, our uh, ministers were in there and. Uh, <laughs> and uh, police officers were in there too, so it's very, very quickly, sorry. Um, this is leading up to the riots. Uh, it's not a really was an election, it was a, he uh, won the election which was against uh, some of the um, opposition. Uh, they spread these rumours rooms that uh, he's buying votes from members of the parliament. Um, as a result of that, there was this mass riot on Yarra, um, where fortunately Chinatown was uh, destroyed. Um, and there was evidence that the ministers uh, were supplying information, supplying water and food to the riders to uh, get them up. Pretty resigned, sort of very came back in. It was not good for anyone. As I said, the ministers were uh, anti Ramsey. The biggest issue for us was that sort of was financed by uh, foreign ministers and supported by the time his government supplied, giving him money uh, uh, through the back door. Let's get through. Uh, he was, his main cry was that Ramsey gave us nothing uh, and the uh, Taiwanese give us the money um, so we should get rid of Ramsey. And the fact of the matter was we supplied $500 million as an Australian government and New Zealand government, but it was accountable money. We had sort of worried about money from the uh, Taiwanese and it wasn't accountable for uh, corruption was rife. This is another example of it. Sort of very uh, appointed a Fijian uh, Attorney General, sorry, a Fijian uh, Commissioner and his own Attorney General, uh, it's another story in that. Uh, just had his beck and call, the Commissioner um, did whatever the government wanted, as I told you about that. Our, our witnesses in the trials against the Ministers uh, started not to remember, and uh, unfortunately we lost uh, two of the cases, we managed to get up on, on one, purely because sort of our these people were uh, getting to our witnesses. We lost a brief uh, of evidence, which is a case file against uh, a minister that was seized by our commissioner. Um, and unfortunately, Sotovari had paid officers within our National Intelligence Unit to uh, basically spy. The issue we had as well was that we were investigating those people who requested us in the first place. So uh, that had its own um, issues at the top. I'm racing through, I'm sorry. Um, Obviously, uh, we're relying on the community to go against the big men, as I talked about before. Um, it got harder and harder as the propaganda went on. The casino was to, this is where a lot of the money went through. A lot of ministers spent a lot of the time there. 
our main brief was we had to be persistent, uh, persistent against this campaign propaganda. We, uh, we didn't go into a sling, slinging match in the, in the political arena or in the media. It was more of a, uh, this hearts and minds campaign of this community support to be maintained whenever we could. Um, and all of our capacity buildings around the hearts and minds to, to get the support from the community. Uh, give them examples of, uh, of obviously what we were doing. If I had more time, we'll talk about the National Intelligence Unit, but uh, that was the area that uh, was more dear to my heart as I got appointed to there because uh, of the issue with the Solomon Islands uh, government paying the officers um, and I had to rebuild the trust uh, within the National Intelligence Unit. The, uh, very much into the SIPF leading the investigations. Um, this is the most important thing of the whole thing was the relationships and trust issue. Um, we had to have that, we had to gain that, and the only way to gain it was to really for them to get to know us and us, us to get to know them. We were only there for uh, two years. The biggest thing is the education of us. Not, I, the thing that I learned more out of this was, you know, I thought I was going over there to, to teach them, to mentor them, but it was more that they did that to me. And most of us were of the same uh, belief when we left, is that uh, we learned more and we grew as people rather than uh, the other way around. I'm sure, well, I'd like to think we did, but um, it did help them, but um, it was more of us having that understanding and the empathy of their culture uh, and getting that trust and building that relationship so we, we can progress and go forward. Unfortunately, there was too many officers from my side of the house who probably didn't have that view and just took it as they're going to earn extra money and do the two years and go. And they didn't work at the relationships didn't build, obviously, and we didn't have success. It was very, very quickly they just come to the side. So it's just a local airport. That's a good airport uh, for that. Uh, Local transport on a day off. Uh, that's JFK Island at the back of World War II where John F. Kennedy uh, went down in his boat and he went to that island. They're very, very proud of that island and it's called JFK Island. They're, um, obviously, once again, I've had more time. It's, it's about this east and you know, west meets uh, the local culture and that's a typical little village uh, hut. And you know, use a 20th century helicopter going through the middle of it. It's just, um, that was everywhere. This is an example of a country uh, police station. This is a fantastic one because the locals in the community really supported it. It was built purposely by uh, Ramsey to assist the locals, and they maintain a police station like that, one of the best maintained buildings there because of their community support. It's a very little uh, local village. It's, that's the way we had to travel. And, yeah. Quickly, intelligence led policing. Um, as I said, this is anti Ramsey uh, business. The intelligence was only for the government, only for the Prime Minister to uh, get his info. Um, we had, there was limited communication outside of Honiara, so to get information into Honiara was difficult. Um, this is the most important thing again, this relationship trust was built. Um, I, said my, I led my team of PDF in there to really not do any work at all with them until we got to know them. And it took, took us about uh, four months to get up to that stage. And, the most important thing is a cultural awareness to, to understand where they're coming from, what uh, you know, what they've got to offer as a not only as a person but as a professional. And this is the key to it: we developed the actual SIP practices because they they had come from a really well organised and professional for the time British police force to a pack of you know, rabble basically. And then unfortunately the, the initial PPF went in there. Didn't, didn't understand that and didn't uh, didn't um, build on what SIP already had. They just came in with their own practices, their own way of doing things, and they wondered why things weren't working. Um, and uh, I changed a, a very simple thing of a brief of evidence, a case over there where we were having uh, delays, we were losing cases, there was just a, a lack of um, um, interest in the case. So. It came to my knowledge that the guys like their own style of doing things. So we went back to their way of doing it, but they wanted, they, they liked a couple of our little things. So through their, uh, through engagement with them, we, uh, we developed a new way of presenting to court, which was basically their old way of doing things. And it just it boomed from there. They, they loved it. And they uh, took it. Uh, where we go? Training, yes, we gave them training exactly. And we in increased their communications with this HF radio project, which we need to know about. 
uh, and we started producing a professional intelligence product to the Solomon Islands government uh, and to the people and to the police force. So it was, uh, it was just pretty quickly a police station in there where we were doing the communication project. That's it there. It's a local school. We're starting to little village smokehouse where they uh, smoke out the pigs. Very quick. That's what it means about this relationship building. We, you know, we just really got on well with each other. He was my national intelligence uh, director, and I was his advisor. And um, he's a great man. Um, so much to offer to the organisation, um, and it's just in there to show you there we got That's us as a team, national intelligence team. We had a little um, get together. This year is very important. If we had another four hours, I could talk to you about these traditional meetings. That's how they prefer to do their meetings in you know, under the trees. Um, I'll talk. Right. It's us teaching him Aussie rules. It's all about this relationship. I can harp on relationships while there's no more. Very, very quickly, I'll just go. The biggest thing we need is the ongoing review of Ramsey, which happens uh, all the time. There's a people survey, it's very, very important. It happens uh, every year. We go to the community and um, we gauge how, uh, how we're going. Um, obviously, understanding the Solomon's culture, education, continual education of us and them. It's going to be a long term commitment. It's generational. It's not a short term fix. I'm going to harp back on it, relationship and trust. And um, sustainability and transparency and honesty from um, from us really. That's what we keep. If I have finished now, this is just me leaving. Um, it just shows you that, that relationship we built. And um, it's looking new means see you later in the future. That's it. Sorry about that. Thank you. Case study, recent case study. Uh, well, Richard here, I would test you on how to differentiate between a Kiwi and Aussie accent. <laughs> I'll tell you a quick test is that if that were a Kiwi, it would have been big fuck, not big fish. <laughs> um, anyway, um, we've got uh, about 25 minutes for questions and discussion, and I'm sure there's a bit else to come, so I'm just hoping for that. Yes, sir. David Anderson from Oxford. Uh, Tony, I'd like to ask a little bit more about the time scale. You, you made a comment in passing early on that the fact that 10 years wasn't enough. Mm. I'd like you to elaborate on that a little bit. Um, I'm going to talk tomorrow about a not dissimilar story in Kenya, where the scale at which you were working at was the equivalent of one district in Kenya. Mm. Kenya has 107 districts. Um, and I can see how, you know, in terms of scale, that, that can work, but when you're multiplying it mm. the way in Kenya you'd have to, uh, I wonder mm. whether it would work. It would be very difficult. Uh, certainly time, as I said, towards the end there, it's, it will be generational. There's absolutely <coughs> no doubt about that. Um, corruption is still there. Um, there is distrust still there. Um, our biggest issue is continuity and time and mission ourselves because we build that trust up which is very very important but we go we go after two years and um, it's the same at all levels of government they're all you know we're obviously we've all got families of our own at home and it's it's it might be impossible to stay too much longer but i would like to see personally uh, even three or four year uh, secondments to really cement that trust and cement the relationship and and try and just individually on individual terms build that sustainability that you can leave knowing that you know, that officer can do his job on his own. But if we all did that, and we all had that same commitment, obviously we would start kicking goals. Um, Ramsey, uh, from a policing point of view, did try to hurry it up too early. They went from phase two to phase three uh, across the board without looking at each individual unit and saying, are you ready to, to move on? Uh, that caused a lot of issues. Um, yes. And we're only as good as the individuals who, who were doing their job. As I said before, there were some people here who didn't care less. They were there for the wrong reasons. And, and what happened to the 25% you dumped? They, out, some got arrested, some still in jail. Um, some have joined Sogavari in, uh, in his little group, uh, and the propaganda uh, against us was from them. Uh, some, I know of two, who rejoined. In fact, one came to Australia just before I came here and when he went out for the tea group. Uh, he, was, he was out for four years from 
push this, but it's, um, it's come back bigger and better than ever, and it's still fragile. So. Can I ask you the next? Yeah, I've got about 15 questions, but yeah. I'll answer you one. Yeah. Um, yeah. This is to do with how did you interact with the New Zealand and Papua New Guinea contingents? I mean, did you have to work out what is our version of the way to police? We are now going to start having a dialectical relationship with the Solomon Islands. Um, first of all, interaction was fantastic. There's 15 nations in the end, all up. Um, Australia and New Zealand were the two biggest. Uh, it was a big problem at the start with each, because in Australia alone we had seven different police forces. So we, I think we had four different uh, police forces when I was there. So in, in all time we had 19 or 20 ideas of how to do things in the process. Uh, yes, uh, there were occasions where that didn't work, where they didn't talk to each other. However, it was led by the Australian Federal Police and it was predominantly kind of their way or the highway type scenario. However, as I've discussed, we quickly turned that around until it was the Solomon Islands way of the highway. We had to, and that was instilled in, into uh, all of us, that we, whatever we could, we would develop their own practices and procedures which they already had in place. And as I said, they, they functioned really well um, for many years. On they were outdated and they were using very old legislation, and that was being addressed at government level. But when we could find the process that worked in the old days, um, we developed that with them. And we got, obviously, they they're involved, so all sort of Islands involved to um, say yes or no how to do it, and that's how we went around around it. And it was great. So the floor to you, Mike. Sure. Just can I ask um, uh, two questions? Well, the first is a bit technical. And that thanks for that. Um, what, what, what role does the Australian Federal Police play in this? I'm confused about the resources. What what does they have in? in in the context, Australia is uh, you know, seven states with seven different police forces, and the Australian Federal Police Force is not overarching. It's just a, another police force, but it was designed uh, to uh, look at to do protection and security of federal property. Canberra, which is our capital city, is uh, based in the ACT, the Australian Capital Territory. So, the Federal Police are responsible for Canberra, and they're responsible for federal buildings uh, around Australia. In addition to that, they are uh, a liaison officers. Uh, around the world are uh, from the Federal Police. So in London, they've got Australian Federal Police, US, etc., wherever. So if it's something internationally from Australia, it's got to be Australian Federal Police. Does it, does it, does it deal with, with the dependencies as well? Sorry, dependencies? Does it deal with dependencies with the offshore islands? Mean, like, I Only mean, to have a liaison office in there. No, I thought the FBI had that kind of jurisdiction or something. No. I'm not saying wrong. No. no. Um, my second point is, 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 is quite different, actually. Mm -hmm. And that goes back to the general question about Policing intervention in what we sometimes call transitional technologies, but whatever that is. Mm. Um, the problem that has been has come increasingly evident that um, when I don't I have to go back to my job before, but the, when the West, right, deals with a transitional place like this in the case, right, it tends to intervene first of all by a process of legalism, mm. new laws, new like new, new courts, new policing systems. And it always invariably neglects the kind of the causal factors, right? Socioeconomic, political, ethnic, and so on. Mm -hmm. When you when your group were intervening at that particular level, what the same intervention last year in government in terms of the infrastructure, in terms of the kind of, 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 of what causes the conflict. I mean you can deal with one side of it, that's been that's right. Yes. Right? It's happening elsewhere, of course that. Well as, as as I said, it was a whole of government that there was every aspect of Government who had advisors from like Australia, New Zealand, or whatever. It was uh, European Union were in, um, all social services were in. The <coughs> issue of the ethnic tensions and the like, especially with white Nazis, many, many, many high level uh, meetings with you know, the chiefs of Malaitan and white uh, Nazi people in, and still working on it in relation to this land dispute. It's all about land disputes. So that is that causal factor of, of the tensions, that's was being addressed and it has been addressed. Once again, that's, that's may well be generational. The causal factors of corruption and, and uh, which led to the, the, um, the, the, the destruction of the economy and, and the infrastructure, that really dates back to the cultural um, heritage of the one top system. The one top system is one talk, which means if you're from one tribe, that's your, your one talk. And if there's a big man in a tribe, he's got to supply money and everything for the rest of the tribe. So it's like their own social um, system where you 
you get supported by the tribe. And that's still in vogue today. Um, there's a lot of pressure on the big men of the tribe to bring back in money to the tribe as they expect it. Um, it encouraged what we, what we would call corruption. Uh, what they, the small stuff they didn't think was corruption, or they just thought it was normal. But, so any funds that they got from the you know, senior government level went straight back out and they pass it out to different people. And we'd see them, we'd see literally brand paper bags of money being given to different people, but they were all there one time, and that's, that's how it worked. To us it looked like corruption, to them it wasn't. Um, but as time went on, and the more westernised they got, there's more money coming in, um, it got worse and worse. And the Taiwanese, certain factors and the sectors in the Taiwanese government kind of played on this, and were giving money direct to Sotovari, to, uh, their main reason for doing that was to get a vote at the UN. Uh, one of as many countries they built a boat for Taiwan. Um, so the Taiwanese fishing, really, fishing um, vessels coming in to fish through the Solomon waters, and they shouldn't have, but the Solomon let them, um, decimating the fishing stocks around where you know, the locals couldn't get the fish. Same with loggers, the Malaysian and uh, Asian loggers coming in and taking out, wiping out vast tracts of land, all through deals with Solomon to get money. Um, yeah. Great to have an Australian police officer in London talking about pond training. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, this is a sort of, you talked about the courts um, uh, and how uh, you could have a kind of pre-court settlement. And I, I'm, I'm just fascinated actually by how that worked. Did it work when you had people from different ethnic groups from different tribes because um, I mean the the material that I know from sort of 19th century peasant Europe um, suggests that that kind of agreement was okay when it was made outside of the courts but once you got into the courts the people thought well you know uh, the, the official law doesn't understand how it functions and the very fact that they made an agreement and then they went into court and then there was something on top, I mean, it, it, it just struck me as being um, potentially actually quite quite a problem, a potential problem. But that, yeah, I think on the face of it, you'd, you'd say, yeah, there could be problems, but you've got to realise the country, Solomon Islands, it was a colony of Britain and they're, they're westernised basically. They, they know the systems there, they had court system before we came in. Um, so it was nothing new to them, the Western laws. So it was, it's not a surprise that they have to go to court for stealing someone else's cow, or whatever it is it's going to be. But um, it still hasn't stopped that traditional, um, that's how they do it. And compensation is big to them, it's, it's embedded into their culture. From murder, like, uh, sorry, I'm not going to talk too long. A Tongan police officer was drunk one night, drove uh, a car down the road, hit two people and killed one of them. Um, his mate was in hospital in Brisbane. Very, very nasty situation. Obviously for Ramsey politically. Um, we got told if it was a white driver, it would have been mass riding worse than the, the earlier one. But it was a Tonga driver. Compensation was first and foremost the thing they discussed at government level. That's how enshrined in their culture it is. So they paid, uh, Ramsey paid like 25,000 um, sold dollars plus rice, lots of other stuff, helicoptered into the victim's family in Malaita. It was accepted with gratitude. It was, um, it was a ceremony for it, all done and dusted, no, foot, no problems at all. But that's how they sort of took all taken. Knowing full well that the Western court system was going to look at this driver. The issue for us was that facilitation act where they're immune from prosecution. However, because it's a a murder, it's a very serious offence. Built into the act is that we are answerable to our own rules as well. So he would have to be answerable to the Tongan rules. So once that was explained to them as well, the new Western system was there as well, um, they, they were happy with that as well. Um, so yeah, it, it just happened every day. Stealing things, rape, murder, whatever. They were always paying compensation. Always fully understanding because they, it's, they've got their Western um, laws um, and accept that as well. Um, they accepted that and they expected that the penalty would be less if they uh, had paid compensation. Because there were some who didn't pay compensation, they didn't agree with it. They said, no, 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 this is too bad, I want to, uh, you know, you, you really, you shame my family, I'm not accepting compensation. When we go to court, 
and that's where it would get ugly, especially if the court system failed them and they got off or something. They couldn't understand that too well. And was there kind of uh, was the tariff, the punishment tariff by the court agreed um, by the the community? No. Um, uh, it, or it's something awarded by a magistrate or a judge? It's awarded by a magistrate. Yeah. Okay, but does he have a kind of um, like uh, our system, it's very much okay. the judges, the judges, and that's what it stands for. Uh, fully aware of it, they're, you know, they're trained, trained in it. Um, there's, and like our system, there are precedents, there's case laws, and they look at previous cases and go from there, and that's how it worked. Um, and it was understood, and as I said, it was, I did not come across an incident where it wasn't accepted. But they have the same frustrations as we all do in relation to sentencing as well, so too lenient or yeah. whatever. And the technicalities of getting off was very annoying to them. I'm very interested in talking about what you saw on the links, but presumably um, there's a sanction that, what you call a sanction at the very highest levels of the Australian government. Yes. Um, just wondering, uh, what, what was the impetus for the intervention? My, my sort of knowledge of intervention means it has to be some sort of value added or strategic. Value for doing so. I'm just wondering why this bill decided to intervene when they, they did and vote for war. But um, I think Andrew Goldsmith has done, I don't know if you know Andrew, but um, Australian academic, but he has written around other Australian interventions. Um, I'm just wondering if, yeah, I'm just wondering if what you're talking is part of the same. So Timor was a UN intervention, and this is not. So then, my first one: what, what was the kind of rationale for the intervention? And the second, was the how effective do you think the intervention was? Um, rationale for starters: A, they were asked. Um, it wasn't that they wanted to. They actually were asked uh, earlier on and knocked it back in that 2002. Australia knocked it back to the you should be able to handle your own internal issues. Uh, it came again, obviously this time came from the Pacific Forum, which was basically the whole of the Pacific, saying yes, we, we as a group realise that Solomon Islands can't do it on their own, and we don't have the resources on our own. We'll ask again, ask again, yes, Australia and New Zealand um, agreed to it. That obviously, this is my view, and it's from the view from reading a few things and, and asking, you know, obviously it wasn't up there, and I'm not that level. Um, Australia saw uh, the Solomons in the Pacific A as their neighbours, and Australia had a, a large uh, part to play in the South Pacific region. And being uh, the biggest country, the most uh, affluent, I suppose, there's a certain responsibility in being a brother to your own uh, family. So that, had, that came to us, uh, in fact, Kevin Rudd, our Prime Minister, came to the Solomons while I was there, and he used words similar to that in helping out our neighbours. Um, now, whether there was higher strategic levels that you and I don't know about, um, the rationale over there, uh, I don't know. But Solomon certainly was a part of you know, our, our British Empire. It's, uh, there's no oil. There's no oil. If I could just yeah. add, when I was in New Zealand when, when these decisions were taken, and the, the, the talk in New Zealand was in terms of regional security mm -hmm. of these failed states, of which there were several. <laughs> There was a concern that these federal states would provide a base for terrorism mm -hmm. against Australia. So there was a definitely a, a national yeah, interest involved. And there was, sorry, but it's also brought back memories of the Taiwanese issue as well. There was a concern that they would be coming in. And that's that was certainly uh, certainly higher than the region. Just a second question um, Apart from this, uh, politicians who have had been arrested for corruption charges. What was your general sense of, if you like, the commitment of the political elite and sort of reforms that, or interventions that you were? The commitment from the Solomon Islands government? Yeah. yeah um, fantastic. The, the ones that um, we weren't investigating, obviously, the ones who uh, just 
wanted to govern and wanted to do the right thing for their country, fully supported us um, and fully, uh, like I said, on many parliament meetings and um, uh, they're very passionate about Solomon Islands, very passionate about building uh, their sovereignty up again, very passionate about being united and saw Ramsey as uh, an assistance to get there. Um, all of them, all those in that side of the house, uh, didn't want Ramsey to go, wanted it to keep uh, going. Uh, and wanted, but also, at the same time, needed a, a, a sorry, not all of them, uh, there was quite a, a growing number of them that were interested in a cut off date, when was it going to finish, uh, to get that sort of trip back. Um, that was something that, but they realised we really couldn't answer it. You know, John Howard, when he first did it, our Prime Minister had those five to ten years. A lot of them kind of really hung on to that and said, oh, well, on this date, we're really going to go away because it's ten years. Um, but as time went on, they realised that, as I said before, there were some pockets of government, some pockets of uh, their infrastructure that could actually have, have they been removed already and they're operating on their own. Uh, but there's going to be others that may linger on for 20 years. And they realised that. Sounds um, familiar. Yeah. <laughs> there's this yes. conflict, is it not, between dependence and sustainability? Yes. And sooner or later there has to be some sort of an exit strategy. Exactly. It's when that, you know, is right mm -hmm. and whether you've actually in the process of the aid created dependence and you've not got sustainability when you go away. It's, it's a very difficult one. It is. That's why it's all over the place. Yeah, it's, it's not one for all, but uh, as I said before, as there are, have been areas where we've pulled away and they are operating around. And, and, and the other issue is, uh, by doing that, is it, it, it reintroducing uh, colonies and, you know, subjugation, uh, uh, as it were? Mm. These are issues that go, they come round all the time into exactly. consideration. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, um, I was interested, you were discussing earlier the swan top system, mm. and it sounds like the category of corruption and the category of tradition might have a kind of permeable boundary, and, yes. and a lot of the stress might go on to trying to define where that boundary is. Mm. And I was wondering if you could say anything about any situations you might have experienced where that boundary was under negotiation. Uh, well, the first thing that comes to mind is that one of my, uh, I was an advisor to what was called the PPC in Honiara, which was a police provisional commander of Honiara, the chief superintendent, who he belonged to a one top where two of these one top were in the government. I, as I said before, this brown paper bag, money going to them. Uh, I saw it, and my initial reaction as a Western police officer was, my God, that's I've just witnessed corruption. Um, because I had a relationship with him in the building, he saw me, I was in the room, he saw me looking at it, and he goes, oh, this is from a one top. And he kind of dismissed it and went off to do something else. So I sat down with him because I had a good relationship and I spoke to him about it. I said, oh, can you explain why? And he goes, he, his question was, as I said before, that um, they're my one top. They earn X amount of dollars. As a chief superintendent of the Southern Lines Police Force, I earn 100 Australian dollars in a fortnight, the equivalent thereof, which is nothing. So he said, to survive as a group, I need the money. Um, and he's my one top and he has to give it to me. So he said, that's, that's us, it's our life, it's our culture, it's normal. And I said, uh, and he then quizzed me uh, about, well, what do I think? And I said, well, it's just reaps of corruption, said, especially the way you handle it. Um, and can you do it not at work? Um, <laughs> <laughs> and he agreed. He said, oh, yeah, we probably should have done it at work. You know? Imagine a, a serving minister of government in England going to the police station and giving a brown paper bag. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. um, so that, that was the, the, my first introduction to it. Um, and it was just, there were similar cases all over the place. With, uh, especially when like, we wanted information from uh, the community about something. Um, one one, one uh, investigator, like we had 30 investigators there from the Solomon's Police Force with the wide cross, cross sections of one tops. So we'd obviously use the right one tops to go in. If we didn't, uh, there would be issues and the payments might have to be made or compensation that hey, what are you coming in causing trouble, um, sort of thing. So uh, that was on a daily basis. And that's what I meant by we had to know the culture, we had to understand the culture and live with it and work with it uh, to get to it. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
is, is there a sense, though, that as it scales up, there's a point at which you have to make an intervention in order to build the capacity of a... Definitely. That, that was the issue where, um, yeah, certainly the, the, uh, the police were educated enough to know that there is a certain amount you can tolerate them and it gets too high, that is definitely corruption under any law. But that is, they've had the British law in there since the 1800s, so they, they know about it. But, um, it, was a, it was an issue for some, and some of the, the corrupt officers obviously went over the, the wrong line. And I, I had many discussions with them about the, the one top system and, um, and, and how it could be perceived and perception, um, especially to us. Um, but that, yeah, I said they're very intelligent people and they, they can see the line, but like all human beings, um, some of them might just stretch it a little bit more than others. I think we've got time for one more quick question, so do you want to pick one of your 14 yeah. remaining? Question okay. 13. <laughs> How has this changed the way you are a policeman in Melbourne now? Uh, 100%. It's about that empathy and understanding, I suppose, um, relationship building with not only uh, the people that I uh, work with, but the community, um, patients. And trust is the big thing. As uh, one thing you learn very quickly over there is patience, because it's sole time, it's on one's time. So it might take me a day to solve a problem, or take me a month. But that doesn't mean it's not a great solution. It's just the way it's done. And that was fantastic for me to operate as a policeman to know that it's not the end of the world. It doesn't take a certain amount of time. Um, and in solving problems, solving community issues is to ensure that you get input from everyone. Where I think, by myself, I would be a manager of a, uh, a place where I was before I left, draw into the Solomons, saw a problem, and solved it my way. So yeah, I know the answer to that, that, and wouldn't really consult with anyone. I, I did that a couple of times, which is wrong also. Um, this, you know, that uh, tribal custom of sitting around a tree, uh, very important for everyone who was there in that meeting to get the say. That's the Solomons way. Um, it might take four hours of meeting, which really should only be ten minutes in our terms, but it was four hours of the best time I had just to listen to see how it went. Um, and you get the buy-in from everyone and you can solve the problem. Um, so those sort of things really stuck with me. Okay, we've uh, reached the end of our time slot, I think. And uh, before thanking our two presenters, uh, it's a pity, of course, that we didn't have Richard here to mm -hmm. take questions on his paper, but I hope his paper won't get lost in the result. So uh, we do have a session on um, post-colonial legacies in Africa. Yeah. Well, New Zealand's not quite in Africa, but um, perhaps if you do have questions arising out of Richard's paper or issues that you think need to be addressed further, perhaps they could be raised uh, in that session. In the meantime, we've got to uh, half hour break now for refreshments, etc. But I'd like to thank our two speakers. Thank you all for your questions.